as I said, the paintings are sort of sources for me and other historians to use to learn about the time period, but they were also meant to be instructive, right? So here we have another Porto room scene, and uh, it's Saint Stefano over there. Got my pointer. Saint Stefano being stolen by the devil, right? So the devil, and this is great, they're like graphic novels with only one page to tell the whole thing, right? So there's the devil, he's stealing the baby, he's putting a Satan baby in. <laughs> if any of you have young children, I advise you to check and make sure you don't accidentally have a Satan baby. <laughs> but then it's also up here flying off with the baby to go do whatever evil, awful things might happen, right? And these are like, again, you would see these all over the place in this time period because most people aren't literate. There's very little, you know, there's no printing, so any books have to be copied by hand. They are rare items, but pictures. We can all look at pictures and learn something. Now, it's not always as bad uh, as things are for St. Stefano. Here we have a baby. The family is at dinner. There's a there's some stranger outside. They send their young child to find out what it is. Uh-oh, it's a devil. <laughs> the devil is going to steal, not steal, but kill their baby. Yeah, can you see that? <laughs> and then there's a baby dead, and the family is, uh, is now standing on warning. But oh, great news. Here's St. Nicholas, and he's going to shoot his St. Nicholas uh, revivication beams out of the eyeballs, and the baby is going to come back to life. This is really funny. <laughs> well, it's forgive me if you told us already, but what are these, where are these um, found, these images? Were they uh, these would be usually in churches. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> you know what's going down. Um, and of course, like the religious imagery can be, I was thinking like it's the Morbid Anatomy Museum, but I gotta get morbid. And I will tell you, I am not a Christian. Right? So like everything about this Christianity stuff seems really morbid to me. Like this is the main thing that everybody wants to look at all the time, right? This guy who's spurting blood, he's spurting blood on his devoted followers. He's also spurting blood like on you today because this would be probably the people who donated the money for this altarpiece that would have been in a church, and you always want to get in on it. And so, like the great news is that we're so close to Jesus, he's actually like dripping his blood. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Holy super creepy, and not just Jesus that you would see. I'm going to just drink a little wine because it's. Super <laughs> <blood present. laughs> I'm not sure through transubstantiation if my chocolate chip cookies will become a <laughs> But it's not just Jesus. There are tortured bodies all around you. Um, because that's part of martyrdom. So here we have a 12th century, uh, the, again, these are all church paintings, uh, 12th century, the tortures of St. Sabinus and Cyprian. I don't, to me, it's like a back scratcher, but apparently it was a very unpleasant back scratcher. Um, here's a much later martyrdom of St. Poseidon, so it's a little less graphic, but he's about to get his head cut off. Like, this is what you're staring. How many of you have spent time during a religious service like looking around at what's in the room, right, staring at the window. So this is what you're looking at. How fantastic is that? And it is not just this is seats. Yeah, what's going on there? Oh, oh yeah. Something it seems to be something that is oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. what? Sorry? It's his tongue? Okay. Well, there you are. It belongs in his mouth. It just usually doesn't come all the way out before going back in. Um, and it's not just... Uh, saints and martyrs who are going to face this kind of treatment, right? So this is not the wildest party that you've ever been to, but actually the last judgment. It is a, a close-up from a, from a painting of the last judgment, right? So remember to be good or else you are going to be hanging around naked with these very bad devilly beasts. Let this be a lesson to all of you. Um, and this is, a, again, a fresco, so this would be painted, most of these are frescoes, things that would appear painted on the walls. Um, but it's not all just, you know, martyrdom and the punishing of sins. One of the, um, one of the sources that I looked at is a book called The Meditations Vitae Christi, Meditations on the Life of Christ. And this was a book that was written specifically for nuns. Nuns were supposed to think about Jesus, but really think about Jesus. Like, feel like you are the one nursing the baby Jesus. 
And I think that I didn't realize this until I started working on this project. Like I knew that manuscripts were, would be illuminated, they would be written by hand, but there might be many scribes, but also many people doing the illuminations. So, and the person who's making the illustration may not have seen the whole text. So they're doing this drawing and sometimes they get it wrong. Like the, what they think is going on in the text isn't what's really going on. And this particular book, there's a, um, a great uh, analysis of it by a historian who looks at like what pictures are in different versions of it. So like in some you see Mary uh, washing Jesus in her own milk. Uh, and this one we have the fantastic, can you see what's going on down here? This is Jesus being circumcised by Mary. Because you know, circumcision isn't a weird enough ritual. Let's have the new mother do that herself, right? Um, Here's a moil. Yes. <laughs> Mommy moil. Um, now, I use other things besides, because it's not a smooth talk sometimes, because I'm just, I'm like trying to show you all the weird, cru weird, cool stuff. I did not just look at visual images, I also looked at some of the um, medical gods from the time period. So the Tradula is believed to be written by one, maybe more than one woman, probably in the 13th century, probably in Salerno, and it's got all sorts of great um, advice on things to do. Uh, some of it is illustrated, but um, often it is left up to the imagination, and in our case it will be the morbid anatomy imagination, right? Mm -hmm. So um, here is the advice to do on excessive heat of, the, heat of the womb. Remember, this is a time when we're thinking about humors. So it happens sometimes that the womb is distempered in hotness, so that great burning and heat is felt there. Treat it in this way. Take one scruple of juice of opium poppy, one scruple, that sounds delicious, right? One scruple of goose fat, okay, who doesn't like a little deep fry? Four scruples each of wax and honey, one ounce of oil, the whites of two eggs, and the milk of a woman, wherever you get that at your local milk of a woman's hand. <laughs> Let these be mixed together and inserted by means of a pessary. <laughs> Leads to the question, what the hell does that mean? This is the pessary, right? So it's sort of this weird like, <coughs> stirring of stuff into the uterus. Um, if you didn't, it, or you might use this as a more of a fumigator, you might also put things in here and it would fumigate up into the uterus. You know, we have to have important treatment. And then I started thinking, some of this actually is not as weird and different as you might expect, right? Because our favorite thing, how many of you have ever given a urine sample to the doctor. We love giving a nice urine sample. I'm actually staying with a midwife, uh, and I'm staying in the room that doubles as her office. So if I wanted to, I could have brought a sterile urine sample with me because the equipment is all in the bathroom I'm using. So here's, these are again illuminated, illuminated manuscripts. Uh, this is a female healer with a vial of urine. This is a male healer. You can tell that he's male because he's showing off more leg. Men's legs were highly eroticized. You know, in this time period and going forward, actually, men's hemlines are getting shorter and shorter. If you think about the sort of pseudo Shakespearean things that you've seen where men are really showing off their tight legs, that's how we can tell a, a gender difference. And this is maybe my favorite part because once you've got that urine sample, you need kind of the Pantone color wheel. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell is going on there? Um, I promised you some gynecology in particular, if you feel like you haven't gotten enough. Uh, these are some of the birthing tools that you would use for the extracting of fetuses. Now, sometimes these were not necessarily all used for live births. Sometimes the fetus has died and we need to get it out of the wound. If she has died too, for example, you can't have the fetus, which is not uh, baptized, buried in hallowed ground. So we have to get the fetus out of her so that she can be buried in hallowed ground. And I guess then they can bless it and it can go along too. Um, sometimes things turn out happier. This is uh, the, the cesarean section, which you can see why I this child was this big. <laughs> Again, a difficult vaginal birth. Um, and uh, I wanted to read you another like wound problem and treatment for the wound because it was just so good I couldn't help myself. So this is about the suffocation of the wound. And here it talks about if, you're, if your womb is suffocating, you can lose your voice. And I actually lost my voice uh, last week. So I'm worried that my womb might be on the loose. But it seems to be. <laughs> Who has suffocation of the womb? Well, I'll tell you. This happens to those women who do not use men. Now watch this. Especially to widows who are accustomed to carnal commerce. Right? You've been having sex. Now you're widowed. You can't. And actually, the nurse is in this category. 
It regularly comes upon virgins, too, when they reach the age of marry, marriage and are not able to use men, and when the semen abounds in them a lot. A confusing principle. Women are filled with semen, and by having sex, you are flushed of your semen, which is replaced by his, better <laughs> semen. Uh, the semen abounds in them a lot, which nature wishes to draw out by the means of the male. From this superabundant and corrupt semen, a certain cold fumosity is released, and it ascends to the organs, right? So this is our problem, and here are some of our solutions. And you'll see there are quite a few. <laughs> the best remedy is that the hands and feet of the woman be rubbed moderately with laurel oil, and then be applied to the nose, those things, so you can rub things on your hands, you can apply to your nose, Things with a foul odor, here's a nice <coughs> list of them. On the other hand, meaning not on her other hand, but just on the other hand, conversationally, <laughs> vaginas ought to be anointed with those oils and hot ointments which have a sweet odor, such as iris oil, chamomile oil, musk oil, nard oil. These things attract and provoke the menses. There's some cubbing in the inguinal area. That's inguinal, a word I would like to see come back. If you're going to tweet or Facebook about the talk, and I hope you do, try to use the word inguinal. <laughs> um, uh, the woman is anointed, uh, there are drams that she might take in. Now, here's an interesting experience. That, that was 48, but 49 says, well, this other physician, Justinus, prescribed for this illness that cumin be dried and given in a potion. In a potion, um, he also prescribed, and this is one that you don't really see every day these days, that the penis of a fox or roebuck, and I feel like there might be one upstairs. <laughs> the penis of a fox or roebuck be taken and made into a powder and inserted by means of a pessary. Now you all know what that means. And then here's some other things that you can do, uh, you know, on and on and on. This is a stuff that you can tie upon the navel is the last prescription. Um, holy Stuff. Like, you know, here's How did they discover that a fox penis is going to cure it? I mean, <laughs> I guess you run through it like an ox penis, then no, a horse penis. They wanted to draw the semen, the bad semen out. Right. So, so, so some of it, right, is sympathetic magic, right? It's a penis, it should be semen related, but some of it, I'm sure, is trial and error. And then it's like, the robot penis line. <laughs> really, like, I don't know whether you want a second opinion or not, if these are the, sort of the status of the penis. Um, and think about, like, Fire Lawrence, right? We all know Fire Lawrence uh, from the play, and we see him just giving a few drugs to, uh, to Juliet during the course of the play, but imagine him, like, dealing out the robot penis. <laughs> there were healers, so he might have been in... Uh, in contrast, but as you can imagine, I had a lot of fun in writing the book, dreaming up different things for people to take at different times. So I hope you will enjoy that along with me. Now, you already got from that first scene, but you know this anyway, that the most important thing a woman can do is give her husband a male heir, right? Or a few. And this is an illustration that is uh, uh, literally about how to make a boy. Now, as astute, um, this is the part where I kind of could over there. Um, as astute audience members, I'm sure you can see the important things that are going on here. The head is covered to keep the essential fluids hot for the voyage to the genitals. The man is on top, and the couple is looking lovingly into each other's eyes to make sure that their humors are perfectly balanced. Um, this is what this person is advising, but there are some other tips from other sources about how to make a boy. So one is that you want a warm, dry uterine environment. You should have intercourse right after menstruation because that purges all of the wet blood out of the woman. You should have intercourse in the morning. You should not have intercourse right after a big meal. And this is a problem that the rich have. They have a big meal and then they have sex. And that's terrible. It leads to them having daughters. Whereas <laughs> laborers are too tired and they're poor. So they eat lightly. They're tired. They fall right asleep. Then they wake up and they have sex. And that's why they get to have all the boys, according to this story. <laughs> and their wives have to do more chores, which is good because it will help keep the uterine environment dry. So next time you're vacuuming, just think about how nice and dry your uterus is. And if this is a likely thing to cause you to birth a son. Um, some stuff is up to the men. The heat of the father's testicles mm -hmm. determines sex, according to some sources. So the right testicle is closer to the liver and has hotter sperm, which is why you want to be sure to tie off the left testicle. <laughs> <laughs> so you have a good, hot, right testicle sperm. Um, immediately after sex, the woman should turn on her right side with her buttocks elevated. Uh, a woman should eat hot, easy-to-digest foods, only good wine. 
um, only crustaceans. Uh, you want to make sure you're having sex when the wind comes from the north, not from the south. The Germans have a lot of sons. You don't want that African wind coming in and giving you daughters. Um, you know, there's, you should drink tea that's heated in wine that's spiced with spearmint and peony seeds, or you can use suppositories of peony seeds and balsam. Um, and you shouldn't have sex too frequently because you want strong sperm. You want to give them time to grow strong. Uh, you know, this all, in case you're wondering, is based on the emerging science that is telling us all about women's bodies. This is one of the diagrams. This is probably a little bit later than my time period. Here's another diagram. And uh, it's hard to see what's on the insides of ladies, but don't worry because science has the answer and I'm about to show you the latest in the internal looking of the female reproductive organs. <laughs> I need to give this talk just so I can show this slide, really. Like, this is, I can't even use the red pointer on it because it's too wet. It's like the most fantastic thing I have ever seen. Um, what book is this from? Uh, An Italian book? Yeah, and I think that I got this version of it. There's a book called How to Do It. Um, and the author's name is Bell, and I think that that's where this illustration comes from. But you can email me and, and find out if I'm telling a lie when I have my slide list in front of me, which for some reason I chose not to bring. Um, so I want to show you how I work that into the novel. Now, the, the problem with writing about women in the 14th century is that they don't really do a lot day to day. They go to church and we'll have a church scene coming up, but they spend a lot of time sitting around sewing. And how am I going to make sitting around sewing seem interesting? Well, I was thinking about the relationship between Lady Capoletta and the nurse. And here is what I come up with. So there, they've been, now she's been in the house for several months. And this is her daily, the way she spends most of her day is that she's with Juliet, but she's also with Lady Capoletta, who, as you know, is feeling the pressure to, to have a son. As the weeks of autumn pass, the wool oil seeps into my hands, its sheepy smell staying with me even when I sleep. I begin to spin stories while I spin thread, stories of tending my family's flock when I was a girl. I tell them as cradle tales for Juliet. Lady Capoletta shows no sign that she listens, until I soothe Juliet through one colicky suckling by recounting an early blizzard that caught me in my sheep the year I turned 12. The storm was fierce as well as sudden, purpling the sky and turning the world so dizzy and white, I not believed we'd ever find our way back to my village. I was shivering as much with fear as cold when a rowdy band of hunters happened across the hill where we'd been stranded. Three of them eyed my plumpest sheep, debating which one to kill off for supper. But the fourth smiled kindly as he eyed me instead, and he convinced the others he'd lead the flock back to my family for what he was sure would be ample reward. Reward it was. And he took it long before we reached my father's house. Is it any wonder the scent of wool moves me to tell such tales, given how, at Pietro's gentle urging, I bade my virtue fond farewell before an audience of buying sheep? We were married before spr the spring snowmelt, I say, and soon enough I was at my own lambing. Lady Capoletta looks up from her sewing, as though she's noticing me for the first time. You've born children, she asks. Barren women cannot suckle. Does she really mean me to tell her that? And neither can virgins, except for the sainted Maria. She listens only for what she wants to hear. You've been delivered of healthy sons? How? How did you make sons? If I can bear just one. I made sons easily, without thinking of it. Made them with Pietro in all the warmth and strength of his youth. Not a bit like Lady Capoletta, with her repulsion over the getting and having of babies nor like Lord Capoletto, bulbous and spotty with age. I did not sit too long in bed, is what I say, either before my husband came to me or after. True enough, for each boy I bore only increased the load of my household work. She nods at my words, though giving up the hours she spends under her bed's rich, heavy covers will not come easily to her, even if all she does instead is to sit robed in furs sewing before the fire. Still, she might as well stop wallowing about like a sow in the mud, so long as a wife loves her bed only when her husband is far from it, she'll not help herself in the getting of a son. The apothecary sent balsam and peony seeds, she tells me, not to take my mouth, but to put inside me. There, she gestures towards her lap. Lord Capoletto read a treatise by a very learned physic, which says that this will help. Apothecaries, treatises, reading. If people put their faith into these things, is it any wonder they never get around to the making of children? 
<laughs> the only memory I've ever known, ever needed, was simply doing what we without money always do to take a little pleasure in our lives. We romp and we rut, and we leave it to the saints to decide when the babies come. Plant cells, I say, flower seeds. I snorted the idea that those are what she needs inside her. And then I tell her things she'd never imagined about how to draw a husband's salve and seed into her. I let my eye catch bolster, carpet, pomander, whatever lies around the chamber. Imagining some copulatory use for every object, I described acrobatic feats as though they're common practice to all but her. I do not know if any of these acts I describe make a womb more likely to form a boy, but seeing how she looks at me like a veal clack calf, watching its fellow herdmates being slaughtered, and then eyeing the butcher as he turns, knife in hand, its way, that is grand amusement to me. <laughs> and if her husband, once he is in that position, can balance with his left leg up, I say, then you might reach across and slip your mouth about his, oh, and then something terrible happens and the scene goes in a whole other direction. And that's yeah. all. <laughs> Um, 